Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see episode three of Black Histories of the Northern Plains. But first, my guest joining me now is Bjorn Solberg, the owner of Hughes Gardens LLC in Halstead, Minnesota. Bjorn, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Appreciate this opportunity. Well, as we always do, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, so right now I'm currently involved in uh, quite a few things. Uh, what I'm here to mainly talk about is uh, how I own a business called Hughes Gardens LLC which is an organic, certified organic potato storage and supply business uh, at a wholesale level throughout our region here. Um, but I'm also involved in many other things. So I'm uh, currently president of the Halstead Business League up in town. I'm on the Western Norman Community Fund. Uh, I'm a mentor with uh, Shakanaw Youth Philanthropy Group for kind of that uh, region up up there. Um, I'm also an MC DJ with Harmon Entertainment in the summertime, so you might see me doing some weddings uh, if you attend some this summer over the next few years. And uh, plenty of other things that I keep myself busy with as well. well yeah, it sounds like it. Sounds like you. Got, so, so where are you originally from? Uh, so I grew up on a farm just south of Fargo. Uh, used to be about 15, 20 minutes. Now we're about 10 minutes or so. It's been growing out to us. But um, yeah, I grew up on a farm just outside and uh, attended Park Christian School in Moorhead. Went to Concordia College uh, in Moorhead. And so I've always been around this area. Okay. Well, as you said, we're here today to talk a little bit about your business, Hughes Garden. And uh, what do you manufacture there? Yeah, so um, I, what I own is a storage facility and a wash plant that was actually built in the early 40s. Um, and uh, a gentleman bought the business from those original owners uh, in about 2000, 2001 and converted it into a certified organic facility. Um, and so what we do is uh, I work with uh, two certified organic potato farmers. So I don't do the growing. Um, I work with the farmers. Uh, so they grow it. They haul the potatoes to me. And then I'm in charge uh, from then on, basically storing, washing, packaging, and then marketing out to various outlets throughout the region. Do you buy the potatoes from them, or is it a, a deal that once they're sold, then y'all share? Yeah, it's maybe a little bit different uh, situation. I kind of inherited uh, the previous system that the previous owner had set up. Um, but how it works is, uh, yeah, they bring in the potatoes to me. I get my orders. I ship the orders out. And then once I get paid for those potatoes, then I'm able to send that payment off to the farmer. And there's a couple different reasons of why we do it that way. You know, how do you strengthen uh, the connection between farmer and then consumer? Yeah, um, that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to um, buy this business was because of that uh, direct involvement and that kind of control that I could have and not only supporting our you know, local producers um, by marketing their products and getting a good price, you know, hopefully for them, um, but then also um, just kind of recognizing the need for um, access to healthy food and um, that's just in um, if you have um, like direct access to a grocery store nearby or if it's a price issue um, I wanted to be in a position where I could help uh, people of all um, income ranges to be able to access healthy food and so that's the other aspect of, of the business that I appreciate. Well and there you go you, uh, you got other than making money, because obviously people have jobs, why do you do what you do? Yeah, I guess um, throughout life uh, you have experiences and those experiences give you a perspective and I've had a lot of experiences that have kind of made me want to focus on reality and um, kind of the real issues that, that uh, are facing people every day. They, they happen to me and my family and I understand that we're not alone in that and so um, really, it boils down to as humans, we need access to food, water, and shelter. And uh, to me, when I kind of dived into um, in college in a sociology class and learned about our systems that we have set up, um, I kind of wanted to focus my attention towards maybe fixing or, or uh, being in a position where I could help, uh, you know, um, if something were to ever happen. And so, yeah, I guess did it because uh, I wanted to make an impact and help people and, and uh, currently in this position I'm in, I'm able to do that. Yeah, from your viewpoint, what do you see wrong with our food system as a whole? Um, well, there's a, a bunch of different factors and that's kind of one of the main issues. It's not one main issue. It's, it's a lot of things that um, in my mind are all um, kind of unstable. Um, and so one of them would just be, and when I'm talking, you know, we think of agriculture and a lot of people think, you know, wheat and soybeans and all of that, which is, you know, food products. Uh, my passion is more on, you know, local fresh healthy foods, so your vegetables and meats and everything. Um, and right now, you know, f obviously uh, we've gone through a long winter and people understand that there's not a lot of local food production in our area. We're really reliant on, say, California and Florida and um, just states a long ways away. And so the distance that they have to travel, 
Um, you have other issues with uh, just size of farms getting bigger, and there's issues with that. Um, the supply chain issues when you have higher gas prices, and you have trucking issues, and you have, um, I don't know, yeah, I could go on and on about all, all the different issues, but to me, the answer or one way to answer a lot of those issues is kind of more local production, more local control over, over uh, the food production. And so that's what I'm trying to help establish in our region here. Mm -hmm. So what kind of small town and community support do you receive? Yeah, so um, my business is located about 45 minutes north of Fargo-Moorhead um, in Halstead, Minnesota. Uh, so trying to buy a, a, a business uh, when I'm, you know, I bought it four or five years ago. It kind of took a six, seven year process to, um, from beginning to right now to be where I'm at. Um, so right off the bat, just the community support in those small towns of uh, the banks and the regional development centers to help me give, uh, uh, give me access to loans um, and grants to help me purchase the business was phenomenal. Um, I have a kind of a unique situation where the original owners of the facilities that I own now um, actually run the bank and a couple other businesses in town. So I have a loan through them and it's kind of been a good relationship uh, working with them. Um, and just also being a new guy in town, a uh, young guy in town, and uh, having a lot of people just offer up uh, support and buying my produce um, from our local grocery store or just saying hello. Um, definitely a, a, a welcoming community up there in Halstead. Now maybe you said it, how many, how long have you had this business? Been so I've owned it for about, uh, I'll be going into my fifth uh, growing year here this summer. Um, so it's spring of 2019 is when I bought it. And I probably started looking into it about uh, 2016 or so. Okay. Uh, so w what's the farm to school program that you're involved in? Tell us about that. Yeah, so my degree uh, from Concordia College is actually social studies secondary education. So the plan uh, the last couple years of college was to be a high school teacher and a basketball coach. And like I said, I took that sociology class and that kind of made me want to rethink what I wanted to do. Um, and so I kind of put my teaching degree in the back pocket for now. I wanted to pursue opportunities and so ended up finding the one um, up in Halstead there. And so while I'm still involved in the agricultural aspect of things, what I appreciate about the business is I have uh, a foot in the door with the educational and healthcare systems. And so farm to school program is essentially um, schools purchasing their products from direct from producers um, or cooperatives or food hubs um, instead of going through the traditional distribution route. Um, that that is standard. So, the farm to school program uh, I've been passionate about not only with giving access of healthy foods to kids in the um, during lunchtime, but also because I'm able to do classroom visits and they're able to have that direct relationship with local farmers and businesses and f um, farmers. I think should be more involved with um, classrooms and kind of being able to show more experiential learning opportunities uh, or being able to give experiential opportunities to students in the classroom. Yeah. Your, your program, is, is it potatoes only that you're working with or is there other produce involved? Yeah, so uh, the business I bought just worked strictly with uh, potatoes. We did work with one producer who had um, grew beets and squash mm -hmm. um, and my goal was to expand upon that um, because potatoes, what's nice about them is they store for a long time so I figured if I can market any other produce uh, from September to May, June typically is when I run out of potatoes. If there's anything else I can squeeze in there, I might as well. But um, unfortunately, it's not uh, always rainbows and, and butterflies uh, in, in the especially agricultural business. So I haven't been able to expand. I've been kind of just focusing on trying to get the, the potato um, structure set okay. up. But, so what, what schools do you work with currently? Uh, currently, I've sold uh, my potatoes to um, Ada Public School System, Moorhead Public School System, Dilworth, Glendon, Felton. Um, and I've also in the past uh, a couple of years ago sold the Fargo Public Schools. Um, I'm hoping to expand into like Detroit Lakes and Alexandria and uh, really with the volume that I work with um, I can be working with any school throughout the state that would be interested. Um, but the main one that I've been working with uh, since taking over and, and uh, looking into the business was working with Minneapolis Public Schools and they've got a really good farm to school program, really robust and, and work with many different producers around the region. So um, I'm trying to take that experience of working with them and start applying it to schools in our region. Yeah, yeah. Has there been any reaction from the schools to, to your potatoes being eat, eaten in the lunchroom? Yeah, so last uh, fall I was able to go to Moorhead. We had a farm to school day event with them and um, I was able to be in the lunchroom and uh, interact with the students. And so they had a baked potato bar that day. 
And uh, what I've heard throughout the years is um, that uh, I never really understood is not a lot of kids have eaten baked potatoes. And so um, to give them that opportunity and uh, it went over well as far as well the students coming up to me and, and uh, telling me that they enjoyed it. Um, but uh, there's also many other things. Uh, Minneapolis has, I know, made wedged potatoes and kind of like French fries with them. So uh, mashed potatoes, I thought would be a big hit, but apparently kids don't like those uh, in some of the schools. So always a balancing act, I'm sure, for school cooks on how to make it right and, and uh, give it you know, to kids where they'll enjoy it. And I would assume mashed potatoes would have been a hit, but I, what do so I know? <laughs> uh, you talked about cooperative. What is the Red River Harvest Cooperative? Yeah, so that is a group of us local food producers in the area here that uh, formed a couple years ago. Um, and basically we run an online farmer's market. Um, we saw that there was a need for uh, not only online, more accessible access to being able to shop for local food because obviously online shopping's really been taking off the last few years. Um, but also we wanted to have a consistent year-round marketplace for people to be able to buy local products. Oftentimes, you know, your go-to place is a farmer's market, and obviously in our region that runs from early to July to, uh, you know, through October generally. But uh, I recognize that, you know, I've got my potatoes throughout the winter. There's meat producers, there's people with high tunnels and greenhouses that have products beyond that season. And so being able to give them a, a consistent online platform to market their products um, is kind of the, the main goal and offer other services too to producers to help them out. One of the biggest things, uh, you know, for me is, is uh, you put a lot of work into growing the produce um, and, you know, harvesting and everything that, um, and oftentimes, you know, for local producers in our region especially, uh, it's a side job for them to be doing. It's not a big money maker, so they've got other jobs, other commitments, families. Um, so really there's not a lot of time for them to market their products. And so that's kind of one of the, the main services that we provide as a cooperative is helping them market, um, you know, in, a, in an efficient manner. Sure. You know, what are current issues that you're facing, farmers are facing, other producers are facing? Well, um, we can start with the weather. Um, that's been, been a huge thing, and you know, that's always been an issue, obviously, but when you have um, either drastically changing or extreme kind of uh, differences in the weather systems and patterns, um, it really affects uh, the agricultural sector. Um, I can speak to me and my business, uh, weather-related. When I bought the business spring of 2019, I finished out marketing our potatoes from that summer of 18, um, but if you know, probably most people won't remember that uh, the fall of 2019 was one of the most wet, early, cold, worst harvest seasons um, in years, and it affected sugar beets, potatoes, um, unfortunately affected me and my potatoes. So outside of uh, um, all that, I mean, weather, definitely an issue, um, but you have your supply chain issues. Um, where are you going to go to, for me at the wholesale level, um, how can I get my product from point A to point B um, in a you know, reasonable manner? Um, you have your marketing, your t time that you're not, uh, it, you know, again, not a lot of time that you're able to dedicate towards marketing when you're sitting at a farmer's market for four hours and you have to set up and tear down and you're playing a guessing game of how much product to bring in and then what do you do with what's left over. Um, there's just a lot of, lot of different factors that, that make it uh, kind of a high risk, potentially high reward, but um, financially at least, but always high rewarding and, and getting people good healthy food. Mm -hmm. Let's go back, can you talk about maybe your family farm? I uh, understand it recently celebrated 152 years? Yeah, 152nd years. My great-great-grandfather came from Norway and settled on it in 1870 or 1871. And so yeah, we threw a, a little uh, delayed uh, farm celebration because of COVID, but invited some friends and family and neighbors over and had a fun celebration. So that's one of the things too that has kind of put me on this path as I've I grew up on the farm out in the country. Um, I never was too interested in the farming aspect. I saw the stress and uh, everything that my dad had to go through, um, factors out of his control that, um, you know, I'm finding affect me too. But um, that's kind of what instilled that, you know, my dad's a hard worker, what's going wrong? And you kind of start seeing there's other factors out of your control that, that play into it. And um, so growing up on the farm, not too interested in production. Growing up near town, I was always social and in town, so I like the position I'm in where I'm not growing, but I'm able to help support and then be the person that clearly likes to talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so talk about how can healthy food be accessible to everyone, you know, in the United States and in the world for that matter. Do you have an opinion there? How can it be? Well, um, I think that's 
one thing is that obviously the, the point of businesses is to make money. Um, and so there needs to be a realization of how to balance having a profitable business, but then also keeping the food accessible for many people. Um, one thing with my business is that um, we basically have four grades of potatoes. And so number one quality is going to your grocery stores. They look really nice, minimal skinning and everything. Number two quality is like what's going to the schools and what maybe restaurants would take because they're going to chop it up before the end person sees it. Um, then we have like a third quality and that's like maybe no one would want to pay for this potato, but, um, but it's still clearly edible and we're able to donate that. So we donate to the Great Plains Food Bank, hundreds of thousands of pounds each year. Um, and then otherwise the fourth quality would be that's going to the cows or just going into the compost, uh, into the ground. So um, I think it's, you know, it's a right that everybody should have access to healthy food. And that's why I'm passionate about the farm to school program is because while we're having kids um, in one location, uh, that's the best way to get them access to healthy food. It might be their only access to it throughout the day. So that's why I really like um, a farm to school program and I'm getting more and more passionate and trying to get more involved in like a farm to food bank where they're not just getting the third quality or the last quality produce. Um, there's, there's ways to get them fresh, good quality um, so that it's, it's not, uh, um, you know, just bad quality going into the people that need its hands. Yeah, yeah. What is the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom program? Yeah, so that's put on by a nonprofit uh, in Minnesota. And so basically they saw that there's a need um, to help facilitate relationships between the classroom and producers, especially during COVID. Um, they saw an opportunity to not just bring farmers into the classroom or have classrooms go physically to farms, but we can use things like Zoom and uh, YouTube to um, create videos and upload it. So they've done a really good job of uh, putting on virtual field trips and also putting on classroom uh, visits, which I was able to do in Minneapolis here a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you stay involved, uh, <laughs> but if, if people want more information, want to find out more, where's the best place uh, you can send them? Yeah, so for me and my business, um, I am uh, much more involved in, in the Facebook side. So Hughes Gardens LLC on Facebook, uh, you'll see more posts and updates. I do have a website, HughesGarden.com. Um, where you can access that. Otherwise, uh, if you want uh, more than just potatoes, uh, you can go to redriverharvest.com um, where you can shop for our products. It's free to um, sign up as a, as a customer. We just need a little bit of information up front, but that's the best way to reach us. Otherwise, uh, stay tuned to the Facebook uh, page for Red River Harvest Cooperative as well, and you can keep up to date with us. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. You bet, thank you very much. <laughs> stay tuned for more. Episode three of Black Histories of the Northern Plains profiles a former slave named Joseph Godfrey, who escaped from Fort Snelling in Minnesota, lived with the Dakota Indians, and even fought in the U.S.-Dakota War. In August of 1862, Sheriff Charles Ruse of Brown County, Minnesota, wrote a hurried dispatch to Governor Alexander Ramsey detailing the gruesome murder of several German immigrants at the hands of a group of Dakota warriors. The last sentence of his letter identified an unexpected suspect among the culprits, Wabashaw's band, a Negro leading them. The events that followed, which we now recognize as the U.S.-Dakota War, were perhaps the most consequential days in Minnesota's history. A unique set of circumstances placed a young black man at their center. In his 1935 study, Black Reconstruction in America, W.E.B. Du Bois asked a pointed question about the ethical obligations of history. Nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all this? So far as the truth is ascertainable. One of the traumatic wrongs in U.S. history was the prolonged insistence upon chattel slavery. Another was the violence land dispossession on indigenous peoples. In the story of Joseph Godfrey, a black man living among the Dakota as a fugitive, we see a unique perspective that blurs our popular understanding of a free North. I'm Troy Jackson II with Prairie Public. Our narrator is Madeline, and this is Black Histories of the Northern Plains. Music 
Though the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820 both effectively outlawed slavery in the United States territorial lands of the Great Lakes and Northern Plains, enslaved African Americans were a regular feature of life in the Northwest. Several thousand slaves had lived in French and British Canada before the European empires abolished slavery there in 1793 and 1834. Many of them were indigenous Pawnee, but this group included enslaved Africans as well. When France ceded Illinois country to England as a consequence of the French and Indian War, for example, 900 enslaved Africans lived in the region, according to Professor Christopher Lehman. Some of these enslaved men and women worked as the personal servants of fur traders and explorers, but many were enslaved by the very people tasked with enforcing law and order in the Northwest Frontier, officers in the U.S. Army, who had moved steadily westward from the original 13 colonies since the United States declared independence. In the Northern Plains, the epicenter of slavery was at Fort Snelling, a military outpost built at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota Rivers in the 1820s and the small Métis communities that formed nearby at Camp Coldwater and Mendota. The unique driver of slavery around Fort Snelling was an extra-legal army program that reimbursed officers for the expense of their personal servants. In this way, the U.S. Army incentivized and even subsidized the cheapest personal servants available to officers on the free frontier, enslaved African children. In 1831, a slave named Courtney was sold to Alexis Bailey, an American fur company trader, for $450. She would work as a domestic servant in the Mendota home Bailey shared with his wife Lucy, the Métis daughter of Jean-Baptiste Ferbeau. Courtney raised her son Joseph, fathered by a French-Canadian trader named Joseph Godfrey, in the Bailey household, and together the two seemed to have endured regular violence. The next few years brought some profound changes for Courtney and Joseph. They moved with the Baileys throughout the Mississippi River Valley, first to Prairie du Chien and then to Wabasha. In 1835, they were separated when Bailey sold Courtney and her younger son William to a Missouri lawyer, who helped them successfully sue for their freedom in a precursor to the lawsuit later filed by Dred Scott, another African-American enslaved in the Fort Snelling community. As a teenager in the late 1840s, Joseph Godfrey escaped to live with the Red Wing Band of the Dakota and moved with them to the Lower Sioux Agency on the Minnesota River in 1853. He lived among them, married a Dakota woman named Takanheku, and fathered a child as a fugitive, unsure of his fate in U.S. courts. Nine years later, Godfrey took part in the U.S.-Dakota War, though his role in the conflict has been unclear. During the military trial that followed the Dakota surrender in the fall of 1862, Godfrey claimed that Dakota warriors had threatened him with death to take part, and in a letter sent from prison to the missionary Stephen Riggs in 1865, he reiterated his innocence, writing, God alone knows I have done nothing bad. Godfrey was one of the 303 Dakota men tried in the aftermath of the war and sentenced to death. He narrowly avoided joining the 38 Dakota warriors publicly hanged in Mankato on December 26, 1862. Godfrey spent three years in prison before he was pardoned and freed. He spent the rest of his life on the Santee Reservation in Nebraska until his death in 1909. The Civil War and the U.S.-Dakota Wars revealed the complexities of race in the Northern Plains and profoundly reshaped life here afterwards. The results of the conflicts redefined who was welcome to live in Minnesota communities and with what levels of personal freedom. Amidst a population boom driven primarily by European immigrants, the fate of free and enslaved blacks and indigenous Americans which had previously been intertwined in the lives of the Bungus and Joseph Godfrey, began to diverge. For the indigenous peoples of the Northern Plains, the end of the 19th century brought continued population decline and adjustments to a new way of life on reservations. Black folks, on the other hand, began to migrate to the Northern Plains on their own volition. The end of the 19th century offered new possibilities, both real and imagined. I'm Troy Jackson II for Prairie Public. Thanks for watching.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.